Welcome everyone. Uh, this is six scalability introduction and the deep dive. And um, I'm Marcel Zimba. I'm software engineer at Google and also a six scalability member. Unfortunately, Wojtek won't be presenting with me uh, today, but hopefully he will join for the Q&A session. He's senior staff software engineer at Google and six scalability tech lead. So first of all, let's start with what do we do as a six scalability? There are five different um, main areas that we are interested in, starting with defining and driving scalability definition and goals. Once we have those goals, we are interested in monitoring and measuring performance of the Kubernetes. So we have goals, we have measurements. So now it's time for improvements. Basically, with those measurements, we can find some bottlenecks and drive those performance improvements in Kubernetes. And those performance improvements can happen in two different ways. Either we just contribute to Kubernetes or we coordinate with different SIGs to, to make it happen. As you can imagine, in Kubernetes, with each version, there is a bunch of new features added. So what we want to do is also protect Kubernetes from any scalability uh, regressions. Last but not least, it's consult and coach community members about scalability. Imagine you want to add some new feature to, to Kubernetes and basically before you uh, start implementation, it might be worth to consult it with, with us to make sure that there is no and the obvious bottlenecks from scalability point of view. And the most important, it's to not to confuse SIG scalability with SIG autoscaling. It actually happens quite often. And yeah, we will go through those five different areas uh, and, and during this presentation. So let's start with defining what actually uh, Kubernetes scalability means. If you ask average user, okay, so what do you want in terms of scalability? Well, they will say scalable clusters. But if you ask, okay, but what does it mean? Well, most of the users unfortunately don't know. So maybe let's let's look back uh, at the history of Kubernetes. And Kubernetes 1.0 was released in 2015. And officially, it supported uh, 100 nodes. And this number changed over time. It was 1,000 nodes, and then in 2017, 5,000 nodes. So you might ask, OK, so uh, how much nodes Kubernetes supports right now? And the answer is that this number didn't change at all. It's still 5,000 nodes. So you may ask, OK, um, well, then six scalability, what were you doing during the last four, four years? Well, it turns out that scalability is not just the number of nodes that Kubernetes supports. In fact, scalability is something that you need to analyze in many more dimensions. To give you a few examples, number of nodes is just one of those dimensions. We have a bunch of other dimensions like number of namespaces, number of secrets, services. And if you have number of services, then for each service, what's important is how many backends do you have per service and so on. So based on those um, dimensions, what we would like to do is um, define safe zone, scalability envelope, which is a safe zone. And by safe zone, what I mean is that if your cluster is within the safe zone, your cluster will be happy. But again, what does it mean that the cluster is happy? What is the safe zone? We will try to define and explain that uh, in more details on the few next slides. So maybe let's start with um, what does it mean that cluster is happy? And here we have two uh, key concepts, SLI and SLO. SLI is service level indicator. Imagine that you have that you have cluster and you're interested, for example, in pod startup latency. Pod startup latency is the time 
uh, how much it takes uh, for pod to be running since it was scheduled to particular node. So you are making those uh, measurements. Uh, you have a bunch of them, and then you take 99th percentile of, of pod startup latency measurements, and it turns out to be, let's say, three seconds. So this would be actually SLI for pod startup latency uh, for, your, for your cluster. And on top of that, what we do as a six scalability, we add threshold to it. Um, for pod startup latency, let's say it's five seconds. Uh, and this is basically SLO. So we can think of SLO as uh, SLI plus threshold uh, that should be satisfied. And in six scalability, um, we have a bunch, um, bunch of different SLOs, a uh, few examples like API call latency, uh, already mentioned pod startup latency, uh, different uh, types of networking latencies like DNS latency. You can find all those SLOs that we support as six scalability on our GitHub page. So maybe let's see uh, how the definition of uh, API call latency looks like. It will be a little bit simplified version. You can find full version on our uh, GitHub page. Um, but basically, um, API calls, we would like to divide them into two, uh, two groups. One will be write calls. And 99% um, of write calls, uh, we would like to uh, have latency below one second. For read calls, we would like to have uh, it's a little bit more complex. If you are just getting one object, like let's say you are getting pod, then the latency should also be within one second. But if you are trying to, for example, list all the secrets in the namespace, uh, then it may it might take up to five seconds. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to list all the uh, pods in your cluster, all the secrets across all the namespaces, then this type of request might be quite long running, uh, up to 30 seconds uh, in total. So yeah, and remember that it's 99%, so you can always be unlucky and uh, in this 1%, um, and basically the, your request will take longer than that. Okay, so we have, I think we have pretty much good understanding what kind of uh, SLOs um, six scalability uh, provides, uh, how do they look like? So now we can actually define what does it mean that cluster is happy. <clears throat> so cluster is happy when all of those scalability SLOs are satisfied. And based on that, um, we can have this kind of like framework and um, that if you promise us that your cluster will be within safe zone, then we can promise you that all scalability SLOs will be satisfied. But we still didn't discuss. Um, we still didn't discuss what's the safe zone. So, if we want to compute this scalability envelope, it's actually impossible to, to compute it precisely, because there are multiple different dependencies between dimensions, which are quite uh, quite complex. And obviously, it's changing all the time. But instead of trying to find like this precise scalability envelope that uh, you can put whatever configuration of, uh, of cluster you can imagine and then get output whether you are within or not, uh, what we can do is actually uh, approximate it. And uh, we try to approximate it by set of limits. And as mentioned before, we have uh, one, one limit that is number of nodes. It's up to 5,000 nodes. Then uh, what we have is number of pods. Number of pods should be less than equal 30 times number of, of nodes. So we can think of it uh, as uh, 30 pods on average per node. And for example, other limit uh, that we have is number of services, which is 10,000. And all those kind of, all, all those kind of uh, limits you can find on our website. So, at the end, what happens is that if you have cluster, you are probably interested in uh, in those uh, in those um, limits. And if they are satisfied, then we promise you um, our scalability SLOs will be satisfied as well. So now we need to make sure that actually uh, for for this uh, scalability envelope, 
uh, those SLOs are satisfied. And here we have scalability testing infrastructure. We will start with cluster loader. Um, a few years ago, actually, we didn't have cluster loader and our scalability tests were purely written in Golang. You can imagine how, how hard it was to actually uh, man, man, maintain those tests. And since then, we developed cluster loader, uh, which is really great. And um, you can basically uh, bring your own YAM with test description. And the test description uh, consists of states in which you want your cluster to be in. So you, you can have multiple states. Uh, you can also specify how to transition between those states. Uh, and during this whole testing, um, cluster loader also is gathering a bunch of measurements. Uh, so he can make a decision whether, whether all scalability SLOs were satisfied, satisfied during this test. Except for that, um, cluster loader also provides a lot of extra observability for debugging, um, which we will actually cover um, later. You can find all those features uh, in our perf test repository, which has also implementation of cluster loader too. The other tool that we commonly use is Cubemark. Maybe it's not a tool, it's actually cluster simulation. So in the scalability envelope, uh, you saw that we support up to 5,000 nodes. And testing uh, cluster consisting of 5,000 nodes, it's, it's quite, uh, quite expensive and time-consuming. Time so instead of uh, having actual 5,000 VMs, what, what we are doing is um, we are creating something we call whole nodes. So here, what you can see is, okay, we have three actual VMs and each of this VM is running multiple hollow nodes. And those hollow nodes kind of simulate regular nodes. The difference is that uh, if, you, if you schedule some pod on a regular Kubernetes cluster, it will be uh, actually running. Uh, but here, if you schedule it on hollow node, then kubelet, which we call also hollow kubelet, will only say, okay, I'm running this, uh, this container, this pod, uh, but it will not actually run it. So um, this allows us to run multiple hollow nodes uh, on one node. And each of those hollow nodes is actually running three containers. Uh, one is uh, kubelet, the other is cube proxy and a node problem detector. So those hollow nodes connect to a master and this master is fully functional. So basically we test this master and whether all the SLOs are satisfied with a cluster loader, with our cluster loader. The only problem with this kind of setup is yeah, but uh, how, how do you actually deploy those whole nodes? So this becomes a little bit tricky because um, let's say you have hundreds of nodes and then you want to run those hollow nodes on, uh, on those hundreds of VMs. And well, running multiple containers is something that actually Kubernetes solved. So those hollow nodes are, are scheduled and uh, scheduled basically by separate master. This master is responsible only for uh, scheduling those hollow nodes and running them on physical machines. And that's basically, uh, that's basically it, it. So we have two masters. This master is, uh, is not being um, tested. And to give you some, some examples, um, I mentioned that, yeah, we, we support 5,000 nodes. We also have uh, 5,000 nodes uh, tests, but using Kubemark, uh, instead of using 5,000 cores, uh, we are actually, we can use 700 cores and kind of simulate 5,000 cluster, which, which is really great because it allows us to uh, cut down the cost, but 
uh, also iterate easier. If, if you can imagine that there is regression that happens only uh, from time to time, let's say one in five runs, uh, then with Cubemark, we can easily run 10 tens basically of, of those runs to, to find this issue uh, easier. So now we will go uh, to observability and uh, debugging. Uh, one of our best tools for visualization is, is Pervdash. Um, it is really great because just satisfying SLO is not always enough. Here you can see example of pod startup latency. And um, we can see, uh, for example, um, the blue line is 99th percentile uh, of pod startup latency. And on the X uh, axis, you can see different runs. Uh, it's around uh, 100 points. So I would say it's like three months. And you can see that, uh, okay, we had around four seconds, uh, four seconds uh, pod startup latency, and then it decreased. I would say on average, it's around 360, let's say. Uh, 300, uh, 300, uh, sorry, three second, 3.6 seconds. So from four seconds to 3.6 seconds. And the question is, was it some kind of scalability improvement? Actually, it was um, regression that we found and then we fixed, but we will talk about it uh, a little bit uh, uh, later. So um, Perdash basically analyzes all those runs and allows us to compare uh, different runs, different SLIs, but also, let's say, CPU usage of VM uh, or memory usage. So it's very useful for finding regressions that are not necessarily violating uh, SLO. Except for that, for each run, uh, cluster loader has ability to, uh, to run Prometheus within your cluster and gather multiple uh, multiple metrics, um, for example, Cube API server metrics or at city scheduler uh, and so on. But also if you are running, for example, DNS latency test, then you can configure it quite easily to also scrape metrics from, from some DNS pods that are making uh, requests to check what's the latency. And with those metrics, uh, we have pretty pretty nice setup of Grafana that allows you to quite easily uh, check uh, what kind of API calls, for example, were violated in what, what part of tests and so on. Except for that, Cluster Loader also automates gathering profiling data. Uh, it's basically a CPU, uh, but also memory and, and mutexes. Base, and uh, once you are running the test with cluster loader, what happens is then at the end, you also are getting a bunch of profiling data, uh, which comes in handy when dealing with uh, CPU regression or memory regression on uh, Kubernetes master. So now let's go uh, to scalability tests. What kind of tests we have? Um, we have periodic tests. That's our these are one of the most important for finding uh, regression in Kubernetes. Uh, we have release blocking tests, but also non-release blocking tests. For release blocking tests, um, we have performance tests. Performance tests basically tests all those SLOs uh, with, with it for two scales. One is 100 nodes and 5,000 nodes, but also we test correctness. So correctness is not only if all the SLOs were uh, fine, that's the purpose of performance test. Uh, in correctness, we also check if it's actually functional. So maybe I will tell you a little bit more how the performance test works. So I would say that the performance test, uh, you can kind of uh, have three main stages of performance test. Um, let's say we are starting with empty cluster and the first stage, stage is to actually load the cluster. So we have the scalability envelope and we are trying to maximize all those dimensions that uh, we think should be in safe zone. And once, once we do that, uh, what, what happens is that the uh, next stage is 
um, scaling up and down different deployments, updating daemon sets. So a bunch of different uh, stuff that's generate, generating a pod churn. And the last stage basically is deleting uh, all of those things. And we test this in two scales, 100 nodes and 5,000 nodes, um, because uh, 100 nodes sometimes help us to pinpoint exact commit uh, that um, you know broke uh, Kubernetes, uh, and uh, 5,000 nodes are run only once once a day. For non-release blocking, we have uh, different tests, starting with Kubemark that I mentioned before, but also storage and benchmarks. Uh, one of the one of my favorite benchmarks is actually uh, Golang compiler. So what we do is we took a performance test. Uh, we've we kind of fixed all the all the dependencies except for the Golang compiler. So we are taking basically uh, one Kubernetes version. All the dependencies are the same. And what we are changing is we are compiling uh, Go, uh, Kubernetes with newer and newer Golang compiler, and we are checking whether uh, whether there is any regression uh, introduced by Golang. And this is super interesting because actually in the past we had um, we had a bunch of different regressions caused by Golang. Except for periodic tests, we also do have pre-submit tests. Um, this is only basically performance uh, test on the scale of 100 nodes, and we are running those pre-submits for Kubernetes. So if you ever created PR to Kubernetes to improve something, and you have this bunch of list of uh, pre-submits, one of them is uh, our six scalability uh, pre-submit. So how are we protecting? Uh, how are we protecting scalability? Uh, of Kubernetes. So first of all, uh, we do have uh, we do have test grid. Uh, everyone, it's publicly open. You can go there and and see. Okay, so what's the status of uh, performance test at scale, or what's the performance um, status of uh, scalability test um, on scale of one hundred nodes? Um, and it's basically one of the uh, first tools that we use for protecting our uh, protecting Kubernetes from scalability regressions. And the thing is that scalability is very sensitive. So we've seen regressions coming pretty much from everywhere. As I mentioned before, one of the examples is Golang, but then also operating system, controllers, API mach machinery, scheduler, etc. Kubelet. And what we do is we either fix by ourselves or we triage that to, to other six. So I would like to tell you a little bit more about two regressions that we prevented uh, in 1.22. Uh, they, they were pretty interesting. Uh, one is pod startup latency regression. So I was actually showing you this regression in Perfdash. Uh, the difference was around half second, let's say. And this, this regression was really interesting because by itself, it didn't break our tests, but due to the perf dash, we were able to find it. And what happened was that the number of goroutines in Kubernetes increased twice. Normally, we have around 500,000 5, of goroutines running in API server at scale. But after this change, uh, which was related to some improvements to priority and fairness, the number of goroutines jumped to, to 1 million. And all of those, all of those um, SLOs were still satisfied, but, but we saw that uh, pod startup latency 99th percentile significantly uh, increased. So we basically debugged it and, uh, and fixed the issue. Except for that, we had really interesting other regression, um, which was really tricky because one of the features was introduced also to PNF. And it happened to be that um, bug was found in totally different place and the priority and fairness was only a trigger for this bug. The idea was that 
uh, you have um, some periodic calls in API server, like uh, updating releases of nodes. And uh, by default, they happen uh, every 10 seconds. So if you have um, 5,000 nodes cluster, then you can on average have around 500 updates per second. And if those uh, updates are evenly distributed across the whole second, then it's fine. But some changes in priority inference cause those 500 or even more calls to kind of like synchronize. And this synchronization is really bad because the load was not spread uh, evenly. So this was very interesting. Um, and uh, that's one of the regressions that we also fixed recently. But also we are driving some scalability improvements and let's go through three of them. So the first one will be efficient watch resumption. Efficient watch resumption is a um, really great uh, new improvement that helps you with upgrading your, your masters. So as you might know, if you, if for example, uh, Kubelet wants to get secret or config map, then what it does, it's making get call, but then also it's making watch call. And this watch call basically should be kept alive all the time, all the time. But when the API server restarts or you upgrade it, then unfortunately this watch couldn't be resumed. And this was a huge issue because um, let's imagine that you are upgrading your cluster and then all those watches break and then all uh, all 5,000 machines are actually trying to, to get what they want at the same time. And this can quite easily overload uh, API servers. So efficient watch resumption actually fixed the issue where, where the watch can be, uh, can be resumed. Except for that, uh, we are working with uh, different six on priority and fairness. We are constantly improving it also from scalability point of view. Uh, like first version, for example, of priority and fairness uh, was not distinguishing between get calls and list calls. Uh, also, as, um, as you might think, those watch calls are also uh, important in Kubernetes. So uh, we also added uh, support for initialization and things like that. Uh, basically, we are working with, uh, with other SIG teams to, to make it better and better. Uh, to have better reliability of API server. And last but not least, uh, immutable secrets. So immutable secrets um, actually um, reduced the load, um, potential load that API server is receiving. Uh, going back to the same example, if, if you have pod and this pod uh, is using some secret, what happens underneath in Kubernetes is that uh, first of all, Kubernetes is Kubelet uh, specifically is getting the secret from API server, but then it also watches for any possible changes. In most cases, those changes never happen. And because they never happen, then, um, then it doesn't make sense to keep this watch. So this introduced immutable secrets that uh, help with reducing number of watches and reducing load on uh, API server. So if you want to get involved, here is uh, some links. Uh, you can find our homepage, but also you can join our Slack channel, our mailing list. And if you want to get involved, uh, then you can just ping us on Slack or, or just maybe uh, you can check how, what kind of issues we have in our repositories with uh, getting started or help wanted um, labels and yeah, looking forward to it if you are interested. So that would be all. And thank you for attending. And now it's time for Q&A. Thank you.